All right, well, good morning, everyone. Man, what a, what a, some great songs this morning. Thank you, Grayson, Kristen, Sarah, and Alan back there beating the drums, the snot out of them this morning. So, man, I just, it was so good, so good today. So thank you for it, yeah. Um, let me, let me uh, I feel like I'm in the dinner theater here today. Uh, so I'm not gonna do any drama up here. Uh, but I did wanna make uh, the parents aware. We initially had our pre-K and K teacher was sick today, but somebody stepped up to take that. So if you're, you have pre-K and kindergarten children, uh, there is a class for them and a teacher who's ready to meet them. So if you want to send them back, you're more than welcome to do that. So thank you uh, to that person who stepped forward to serve our family uh, in this moment. Well, I want to encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're coming up to the end of our study of the book of Ephesians. Uh, and uh, it has been to me, and I know I've had many people uh, say this to me, it's been uh, a particularly um, good series for them uh, because God has used it. Uh, you can see around our auditorium, if you're visiting here, these are the verses that we've been memorizing as we've worked our way through the book of Ephesians to try to put some of the key thoughts uh, a little bit, uh, to hold on to them and kind of root them a little bit and put them in our souls. Uh, and so uh, it's been a very good uh, thing for that. I was telling the group as I was preparing back here this morning, and we were uh, praying before we came out, uh, I was anticipating this week uh, we're going to talk about the armor of God, which is the concluding uh, portion of that, and I was expecting to have a battle this week, and I was not disappointed. Uh, uh, just in the moment where uh, you become aware of the battle uh, is where uh, the evil one uh, is going to be busy. I think one of, his, uh, one of his tacks is to make you think that you really don't have any opposition. And that uh, if you're in an environment, like you're in church right here this morning, you're thinking, well, certainly this is a safe environment where I, I can expect that people won't, uh, where bad things won't happen, right? Uh, and in reality, that just lulls us asleep to the idea that the real battle that's going on this morning really isn't happening between people. It's happening in the hearts of every person who's sitting in here this morning. And one of those battles, uh, because the scriptures are, uh, Paul teaches us here, is that one of the primary weapons the Christian has to do spiritual battle is what God has revealed about himself in his word. And one of the things that I know that the evil one is going to be doing over this course of this hour, because uh, I know he doesn't want us to listen or pay attention to, is he wants you to make you think about all the difficult things that happened before you walked in this door today and to think about those the whole hour. He wants you to uh, see the person next to you who's drawing really strange things on their tablecloth, right? Uh, he wants you to, uh, you go to your phone and you go to open it up to get to the scripture and he's wanting you to be uh, sidetracked by something that pops on your screen uh, that you want to just sideways go over and then pretty soon you're reading this article or that article and that you're not listening to the word of God as it's being preached. So uh, in this moment, right, and he's willing, he's also uh, wanting us to look across and see someone that uh, maybe we've had a disagreement with or we've had a difficulty with and then uh, make that disagreement stand so, uh, so large in our vision right at the moment that we can't hear what God wants to say to us. So I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, we're doing battle even as we're learning about the battle, right? We're doing battle even as we, and as we've rejoiced and sung this morning, Paul's going to end with a concluding illustration that says, yes, God has triumphed. Yes, God has won the victory. Yes, you get to participate in that by belief in Jesus Christ. But the decisive battle has been won, but the wrap up is still coming. And we live in between the moment of the decisive battle fought on the cross where Christ conquered everything that truly stands over against us. He's seated in the heavenlies, right? And we're seated with him because we have all of his riches in Christ. But he's given us a down payment on everything that's yet to be had. And one of those things about this moment of down payment we have genuine life, we have genuine resources, we belong to him, we belong to the family of God, but we still live in a world where the evil one is active. We still live in a world where powers and principalities and spiritual forces are busy trying to claim the allegiance of your heart every day. 
to make you think you're someone that you're not, to make you forget that you're a child of God, to make you think that you don't have the resources to build your marriage, to make you think that you can't forgive someone who's hurt you, to make you think that you, you can't make it through the circumstances that you're in. And he wants to tempt you to find some other false savior to go after. He wants you to look to another person who doesn't love Jesus because they offer maybe finances or security. And he says, no, don't go there. He wants you to turn to pornography. And he says, no, don't go there. He wants you to turn, right, to the advice of ungodly people that says you want to bail on people. And God says, no, don't go there, right? So all those things is where we are at the moment. And so we want to look at the battle as we come. We want to talk about it. And I, I hope to, to help you to understand that what's happening here, even though this is one of our favorite passages, uh, if anybody has grown up in the church, this is one of the favorite passages for Vacation Bible School. Is it not? Right, the armor of the Lord, is that not one of the famous past? Why? Because it's just great. It gives you like five days of different topics to go after. One day is the, the belt right, the, of truth, right? The other one's the shield of faith, right? You got the blessed breastplate of righteousness, and it's a great visual, right? You can have somebody dressed up like a soldier, right? So it's like a win-win with kids, right, in terms of that. But what we want to, to talk about here is that this is really an illustration of the reality of life, this side of Christ's return, Right? And that he's going to use a metaphor, a picture, that really is summarizing everything he's already said. So he's not introducing anything new. We've already been introduced right from the very beginning that a battle took place and Christ conquered the evil things. If you want to read about it, read at the end of chapter 1, right? And we're entering into, we used to be in league with the dark Lord. Why were we in league with him? Because our hearts resonated with his rebellion. And we were rebels just like him. And when he came along, we said, there's our leader. And we followed him. And Christ broke in in the love of God and he rescued us from our willing bondage to the dark Lord, brought us into the kingdom of light, and now wants to send us back out to bring light and life into the lives of people who are still in bondage. And all the while, the evil one wants to take us back into that bondage every day, right? And so there isn't a square inch of your soul today that isn't contested, right? There's not one square inch of your soul. God is wanting to claim every square inch of your soul, and Satan's want to claim, he wants to have a counterclaim against every claim that God wants to make. And that's where we are. And let me tell you this, there are no days off. There are no days off. This is why as, as you follow Christ, right, you're watching, you're waiting. The posture is always active. There's no days off. Uh, and as you get there, one day, this is one of my favorite metaphors in Scripture, that it speaks about heaven as rest. Right? The book of Hebrews says you enter into your rest, right, where things will be resolved. This side of heaven, and we know we're heading into a season of rejoicing, but also as a season of all kinds of relational challenges, Right? expectations people bring into the holidays. They want them to be sweet seasons. And let me tell you right now, whatever expectations you have for the perfect holiday, they're not going to be met. All right? And you're going to meet those relatives you haven't seen for a while, and you know what? They're still the same relatives. Right? And they're still irritating, and, and they're still going to do some of the things. You're going to have one of those moments, which is families we try to avoid. Everybody hopes that nothing will blow up, and then you have one of those moments where it all blows up. Right? All those kind of things happen. Or you get focused on setting the table instead of being at the table with people. Right? All kinds of things are going to happen because we're, there isn't a day off in terms of this battle and every day is here. So let's come back into the story and remind us one of the things we've been trying to do as we've been thinking about studying the scriptures is trying to help us all to think about how to read well. Right? We want to read the scriptures well, and one of the things that we always have to do is we have to keep putting all the individual passages in the Bible back in the context in which they belong. And if we don't, we can miss out very much on their meaning, and actually we can actually misrepresent them altogether. And we live in a culture that does that all the time. Right? We talked about freedom today, and that, that, that idea of freedom comes from John, John chapter 8. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, that gets quoted all the time in the secular context. Well, what's the truth? The truth is that you're a sinner and that you're lost and that Jesus is the Savior and that he's made it. It's not just any truth like, you know, two plus two equals four and you're set free. No, 
right? You have to know Jesus to have that kind of freedom. That's a freedom from sin's bondage. And you want to read about it in John chapter 8. You were a slave to sin, and now you've been made free from that slavery, right? So one of the things that we've been trying to do is we've been trying to keep the big picture in view of what Paul is doing. So by the time we get to chapter 6, we need to make sure he's already said six chapters worth of things already, And we want to bring those to bear. And we found that the book has two big divisions. The first one is telling us about what God is, who God is, and what he's done. So it's a a statement about what God has triumphed. So it's enjoying God's triumph, what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in Christ by the work of the Spirit to restore and reclaim all things. The last song that we sang, I love that, right? He not only brought you to himself, he brought us to each other, and one day he's going to reclaim everything, right? One day he's going to reclaim everything, and the sunsets will be really beautiful sunsets because they'll be free from all the effects of the fall, right? We'll have a completely reclaimed world, and that's what God's up to. And this triumph not only involves what we can see, you and I, but it involves things we can't see. And of course, in the biblical world, the most significant beings, the most significant beings are ones you cannot see. God is the most significant being in the world. He rules and reigns over it. It's sustained because he holds it together. He's the only one that can bring, put it back together, what we've torn apart. He's the most, and to get that right is to get life right. And to know that your real battle really isn't with Van, really isn't with Colin, even though I'm sure it is with Colin, it, and it, even though it isn't with Rebecca right here, it isn't with those people, your real battle is against forces that want to get you to give rein to the darkness in your soul. The evil one that wants you to make you a guy driven by lust or wants to make you a person when you come to Christmas a little greedy, like a little greedy kid. Or when you come right to the moment that you want to be elevated and you're going to crap on these holidays because somebody's not going to give you the right gift. They should know me by now. They should have given me that kind of gift. And they didn't give me, they didn't, they didn't uh, recognize me in the way that they should have recognized me. And your pride is going to make that moment a dark moment. Right? All those kind of things are going to happen, right, in terms of that, because the, the battle is right here, right in us. So he's saying, we've got the victory, and you've been brought out of that. You don't need to live that way anymore. You don't need to go back into that. And then in the latter half, where we are, he wants to, us to proclaim it. He wants us to live out this new identity that we have. We're no longer slaves to the evil one. Now we're children of God, right? We've, been, we've got a new identity. We need to live like we belong to a different family. And we need to appropriate the resources. And so where we are here, we're down at the very end, the practical implications, we're at right here the posture, really, and the full armor of Christ's new people, right? So when you find God's people, you find them clothed differently. And he actually picks up a metaphor that he used earlier in chapter 4 to put on, to put a new set of clothes on, right? A, A picture of a new identity, of a new way of seeing yourself, of a new sense of your mission and purpose in life. Right? You get into that every day. And one of the reasons that we sing when we came is we're, we're, we're reimagining. We're reimagining ourselves for who we are. We're reimagining ourselves as people who've been reclaimed by Jesus. That the most significant thing that's happened in history is the cross of Christ and the resurrection from the grave. And we're being reminded of that every time. We're being drawn back into that truth that the most significant thing is not what's going on in Washington, D.C. today. All those kingdoms will rise and fall. God even says in Isaiah 40, you know how I view the kingdoms of the earth? They're just like a drop in the bucket. A drop in the bucket. I will raise up kings and I'll set them down. And one day when the king returns, which we sang about in O Come, O Come Emmanuel, he came once and when he comes again, he's going to establish his kingdom over the whole earth. That's why when Jesus says that if you follow me, the meek, the people who come to know me right through faith, they will inherit the earth. He wasn't speaking in hyperbole, right? So that kind of idea. So let's dig in a little bit and let's read the first part of our passage in Ephesians 6, right? Let's read verses 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against 
the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Right? Now, here's what he does in this very first section. Oops, went too far. It's fighting me here. Come back. All right, there we go. All right. So three things he gives. Uh, why, why do we need to take this posture? Why do we need to be people who are, right, the, if the, the mazes, right, are up here, you got your, you know, your, your, you got to stand. And it is, it is a stand over against and a stand for. And we're going to talk about both of those sides of what's going on. But, but if today, if you're not prepared for the fact that the evil one is after your heart, you're unprepared to live this day. You're just unprepared, right? All of us know, even in the realm of, of human relationships, I've mentioned to this before, you could have a conversation with someone that may take you years to get over today. And nobody plans on having that kind of conversation. You just were careless. And then you were unprepared, and the other person responded in an equally ungodly way. And then you fed it, and then they fed it, and then you fed it, and then they fed it. And then all of a sudden, you've blown up. And, and to get yourself out of that, and you're hot, and you're angry, and you're going to walk away. And you know what you need to do. You need to repent of what you did and go back. But your pride is telling me, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. They're going to do it first. Right? And then all of a sudden, and then finally, when you recognize it, you have burnt right, the ground between you. And you've got a hardened heart against them. And Paul warns us, right, bitterness creeps in, anger, self-justification, all that stuff happens. And that happens in families every holiday. Right? Some of us are sophisticated enough that we don't let it actually blow up in person, but we just let it settle in our soul and then talk about the family when they leave the house. Right? So all those kind of things that are here because you're in a spiritual battle. And if you're not prepared for it, you're going to be caught off guard. Today, right, if you're a young man in here, you're in a spiritual battle to keep your, your desires in line. If you're a woman in here, you're in a spiritual battle to keep your perspective of yourself the way God defines you instead of the way the social media wants to define you. You're in a battle to control the way you think of yourself every day. In terms of that. And so what do you put in the full armor? And here I want to say is that the emphasis of this uh, message, uh, uh, of this passage, is not on making sure we connect a particular resource with a particular piece of armor, right? So let me, let me just, just say this. Sometimes people want to spend a lot of time and say, why is it the helmet of salvation as opposed to the shield of salvation? Right? And so they want to think a lot, well, helmet, helmet. And then they start thinking about the head and they start thinking about these kind of things. And when you look at Paul, when he talks about the armor of God, sometimes he will put different virtues with different pieces of armor. And so if you read it this way, you have a tendency to go to other places in Paul, like First Thessalonians, and say, Paul, Paul, you mistake this. You put the wrong virtue on the wrong piece of armor. <laughs> Right? As if Paul was trying to make sure we connected those. The emphasis of the passage is being fully armed. Right? Is being fully armed. That's the idea. Because it's creating this picture of a person who doesn't have any openings for the trickery of the evil one to get in. Because you're so covered with an understanding of yourself as God has saved you and brought you to himself. You have such a clear picture of God's power and his goodness. You have a, such a clear picture of your mission that you don't get distracted when the evil one tries to get you off mission. You don't look at a person as a resource to be exploited. You look at them as a brother in Christ who needs to either be brought close to Christ or if they're not a believer, as someone who needs to be introduced to Christ. You don't forget who you are. When somebody tries to tell you you're only as good as your last achievement, you go, no, 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 my goodness doesn't rest in my achievements. My goodness rests in the fact that God loves me. When somebody tries to tell you you've blown it in your life and, and you've, you don't have any future, and what, what do you have to say? Look at all the crap you've done in your life. You say, no, 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 I'm forgiven, right? So you're fighting all that all the time. But the key thing is you've got to be fully clothed because the evil one is looking for your weak spot, right? Let me, let me give you just a, a, an example here that I find sometimes in, in counseling. If you can't come to your marriage and you come from a broken family or a family that was a disaster, right? 
or a family that even the parents hung together, but you vowed to yourself, I'm not going to have a marriage like that. What that builds into you, it builds in fears and insecurities into your own marriage and into the way you think about a marriage. And the irony is, is that you wind up actually redoing what your parents did because you're hardwired to do it. Well, you need a different confidence that's rooted in Christ. That, that, and I tell this to couples all the time. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what those things are. That's given you a new, it's given you a unique perspective on your marriage. But you have every resource in Christ to bring that legacy to an end with your marriage. You have every resource in Christ to bring that legacy to an end. So you can have your kids down the road. You will tell them about the broken place that you came from and they won't understand it because they didn't experience it in your marriage, right? So where we are, right, we need full armor because the different challenges that are represented in this room are very different because we have different pasts. We have different families. We've made different mistakes. We've had different backgrounds. And the challenges that we have in the evil one knows where your weakness is. He knows where your insecurity is. He knows what it is that if you just touch on it, and some of us may not know about it, right? So I know I've mentioned this before, but when I was in college, I struggled with bulimia. I struggled with an eating disorder. And guys did not talk about eating, eating disorders. I didn't tell anybody that I struggled with it at all, right? And for the longest time when I struggled with it, anytime somebody would make a comment about my weight, it would send me in a spiral and nobody knew. Why? Because that was my particular weakness. Meals were a battle time. I hated Christmas time because of all the food. Right? All those kind of things about, I don't know what your struggle is, but some of you have something here that you're wrestling with, and it doesn't need to be public, but the people in your life know about it. And all of a sudden, a comment that would just go right over my head and go right past everybody sitting around there, all of a sudden, you're thinking about it all afternoon. Right? And you're naive to think that you're not impacted by those. Okay, in terms of that. So the, we, got, we need full armor. We need completely clothes so that we can stand against the evil one. We can say, no, no, that's the evil one. No, I don't believe that. And stand for the truth, right? And you will need that not only to stand against the evil one and for the truth in your own life, but you'll need to do that in your brother's and sister's life when they come to you and talk about their struggling marriage or when they come to you and talk about the sin that they're wrestling with or when they come to you and they're talking about the difficulties they have at work. Right? Well, you need to stand against the influence of the evil one and for the cause of Jesus. You follow me on that as we get there? All right. Now, this next section, let's dig into the armor a little bit. Here's what he has to say. So let's read the, this famous passage. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Now, the way Paul words this, there's different ways to say it. Um, it it's, it's, uh, it's getting a picture of right away. Pick it up. Get ready, suit up, right? So it's not, it's not uh, talking about a way of life as much as an activity that needs to be taken up with all diligence and haste, right? Go after it, right? Pick it up, right? Today's a day you need to pick it up. And so it's not a day that I can drift. I need to pick up the armor. So he says, um, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, so stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can dis extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and... Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Okay, now let's look at these, and I want to encourage you if you have some notes, as I mentioned to you before, if you've got your bulletin, there's a little sheet there that you can take notes, or if you've got your uh, study booklet, I want you to write these down. But here, I'm not looking for you, not encouraging you to write down everything that's going to be up here, but I want you to write down what God's dealing with you about. 
okay? What you need to hear this morning may be different than what your husband or wife needs to hear, than what your dad needs to hear, than what your son needs to hear. Do not listen for somebody else. Right? That's one of the tricks of the evil one. You listen for everybody but for yourself. You have no control over the people in your life. The, the, the best thing you can be for the people that you care about is a you faithful to Jesus. So let's do that, right, as we think about that. So don't listen for your wife, husband, hus- wife, don't listen for your husband. Don't listen for your kids. Don't listen, as a professor, for my students, right? Listen for yourself today. What does God want you to see that's kind of the, 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 the point of the battle for you? right where you are. Okay, so here's one. So these are the things he's going to go after, and you'll see these phrases in your notes. And so the kind of idea is when he says, put the, the belt of truth, right? Really, it's just put, gird up, you know, the, the famous uh, King James rendering, gird up your loins, right? Gird up your loins. We don't use loins anymore unless we're talking about a cut of meat, right, at Christmas or something, right? Uh, but the, you know, the whole picture of in the ancient world is that you needed to have something fastened because you wore clothes that flowed freely around you. Well, you needed to get them tightened, right? And you put this belt around you. And, and truth, metaphorically, is this belt, right? The truth of who God is, of what he's done, of who you are, of what the real battle is. Every day you need to put that truth on, right? Because you need to tell it. And I'm, I'm telling you, and I, I'm as guilty as anyone in this room, Right, all of us, did you get your uh, amount of time that you spent on your phone? Did it pop on your phone today? Did anybody do that? See some, some smiles, some grimaces, right? How many hours a day you spent on your phone? And every day you're on your phone, it's telling you who you are, about what the most important things are, about the things you should care about, about what you should take your time, of the type of people that are influencing you about what it means to look good and to be desirable, Right? That, that message is out there all the time. Right? And so every day you've got to keep reminding yourself, well, what really is true? What really is true? And what's real? And what, what, what really matters? So I have to be reminded, right? Often when Ron and I are praying, the very first thing we talk about God today, we need to be reminded, we need to take us back that you're the God who's ruling and reigning today. That things are not out of control. That the people who are doing crazy things, they're not the ones that are determining our future. They're not determining the destiny of where we're going. God, ultimately, you're in control. And the best thing we can do today is be reminded of that so that we don't try to fix something in some illegitimate way. Or we don't become, you know, Henny Penny who's running around saying the sky's falling. Right? And so I need to be anchored to that truth today. It doesn't mean that my day isn't hard. It doesn't mean that I might be weeping over things, but it ultimately means that things are not hopeless, that I can follow God and trust him in this moment, and I can do everything that God requires of me, even if the people in my life are not. Right? So truth. I need to put truth around. And this is, you, you, I, I pray regularly for my kids and their, and their husbands. I pray regularly. God, please, would you prompt them today to make space for you today? God, would you, you prompt them today so that they'll pull aside and they'll be reminded of your rule and reign, of your presence, and they'll let you speak into their life and they will speak to you. That's the most important interchange they need to have today, right? So that's there, the truth. That's the truth about it. Then the second, conform to Christ's character. This is, right, the, the idea of here where he talks about the breastplate of righteousness, And here, I think, it's the idea of us pursuing the character and passions of Jesus, right? That that what's true is that God, to have a true, genuine life, a fulfilling life, is I want to come to love what Jesus loves. I want to let his standards become my standards, right? So I'm trusting, right? And I, I know I've said this to you before. I'm trusting with Ron and I right, with our different personalities, and anybody who knows us knows that we're different in personality, right, and our different kind of ways of orienting to life. I'm trusting God that for me as a man to hang with her for all of life and let our differences grate the bad stuff out of us as we lean on to Jesus, that's the best life. That's what I'm trusting, right? 
I'm trusting that in terms of our church involvement, the reason why I'm at church this morning is not because everything that's ever happened in these doors has been good to me, right? Not because I've never been criticized or sometimes been hurt wrongly or even had my children hurt at different times. I'm not here because of that. I don't expect people to be perfect, and I know I have hurt people and disappointed people in this room. There's no doubt about it. The reason I'm here is because I believe in Jesus, and he said, this is the people of God, and you're to come together, and that struggle as you grow together in me is essential for you to grow. And matter of fact, your love for one another is essential for you to proclaim my reality. So I'm trusting him for those things, right? I'm going to conform to his character. His character is kind and forgiving, truth-telling, right? That's the character of Christ. He is the one who serves the will of God without reserve. What's one of the key things in Ephesians? I want you to become people who approve the will of God. I want to be like Jesus. I want to put on that every day. He is my hero. He is my hero. I don't care what the best athlete is. I don't care the most powerful social media influencer. I don't care the person that's in your group that seems to be the most popular, whatever the case may be. It's the character of Christ that I want to aspire to, and I will find it reflected in other godly people, but often I'll have to stand over against what's around me if I want to follow Jesus. Okay? The conform. Then thirdly, I want to trust God. Right? Take up the shield of faith, right? And the shield of faith, if you think about the posture that is faith, just noted this to myself here this morning, when you think about that posture, it's an active trust in what God has said and done. An active trust in what God has said and done. Okay? And and an active trust in what He said and done, and it also is accompanied by an abandonment of everything that stands over against it. Okay? So I believe Him to be true. Right? I've said this to my students at different points in times, and, and if you've walked with Christ over the years, you will have that question in those dark moments of life or in those difficult moments, is it really true? Is it really true that a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the most important thing for everyone in my life, for me and everyone around me? If, 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 my, if the people that I love, even if they're wealthy, even if they're popular, and even if they have all the things that the world might think and they don't know Jesus, I should be weeping in my prayer closet. If they know Christ, then I should be rejoicing in their identity in Christ, encouraging them to love Christ and to follow Him, and walking through them like Christ. Walk, walking through their difficulties like Christ to help them see his presence and goodness in the midst of their suffering. So the issue here is uh, to conform the, uh, the, the character of Christ to take up the shield of faith that we trust God. And I, I forgot one. I went right past it, right? Uh, I skipped to the shield of faith. Let's back up a minute and take um, um, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, this is kind of, this is kind of a mission ready. This is kind of an interesting thing. Your, your feet fitted with readiness, right? It's really kind of a, that your feet are ready for action, right? And why does he say the gospel of peace? Well, you're ready to be a peacemaker. And, and it's two, twofold, right? Twofold, because you can go back to chapter 2 and read about this at chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, Right? The peacemakers are people who declare that God has acted to deal with the wrath that you justly deserve and make peace between you and him if you believe on Christ. So we as the church are called to go out and proclaim that God has made peace and he's calling you to be reconciled to him. So we're, we're trying to make peace between God and people. And on the other hand, because we have been brought into this relationship of flourishing, this relationship of peace with God, we're called to maintain that relationship of peace between each other. And so I should be a person, this is why in the church, I should be known for trying to keep relationships healthy, not for dividing people against each other. This is why in the church, gossip and slander and divisiveness, they don't belong in the people of God because that's, care, that's contrary to being the peacemakers that God calls us to. Everything about, and this is where you read about this in chapter 4, 
when the Spirit is at work, what do you find? Oneness around Jesus. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one calling. And if you forget the emphasis of one, he's going to say it another 30 times, right? So when you find the work of the Spirit, you find husbands and wives loving together and serving Christ together. When you find the work of the Spirit, you find a group of high school and college students that the center of their relationship is Jesus. And if they're loyal to each other, they're loyal to Christ on each other's behalf. And when you find a church, they want Christ's mission to go forward. I don't want to be elevated. We're not trying to elevate anybody else. We're trying to elevate Jesus. And if my service does that, even if nobody recognizes it, was Jesus elevated is the only question. Right? And so the issue here is that we're mission ready. We're prepared to be peacemakers. Right? And if you're like me, I'm not a good peacemaker in the sense that I hate conflict. I like to run from situations where God calls me to go in and make peace. Okay? And so the issue here is a peacemaker. And then shield of faith, uh, believing on what God has said. And then helmet of salvation here, uh, E. Know who you are, whose you are, and know who you are. Right? I think here that he's talking about to have the helmet of salvation is just this emphasis that you have been saved by Christ. Go back and read in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Right? You used to be uh, a zombie. You used to be a vampire. Right? You were alive uh, in, in some sense, but you were dead spiritually. And Christ rescued you by the love of God, and he brought you into a new relationship with him, and now he's going to spend eternity lavishing his favor on you. And in the meantime, he's got good things for you to do because you're his workmanship. Right? So you need to know whose you are, and you need to know right? Who you are. Whose are you? And I, I know I've mentioned this to you before, but I've never forgotten it from my high school days. As one of my friend, mother's, friend, one of my friend's mothers uh, would send us out of her house by looking us in the eye and say, today, Greg, as you leave this house, remember who you belong to. Who you belong to, right? And then uh, the sword of the spirit, renovate, right? Your heart, Resist the temptation of the evil one, right? Raid, and what I mean by this, go aggressively at the falsehoods that one another, we, get, we buy into, right? And, and that phrase, of course, comes from Jesus, either in Matthew 4 or Luke 4, right? By every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus says, I don't live by bread. I live by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. What tells me today who I am? God's word. What tells me what's most important? God's word, right? What, what, who, do, who do I need to be around? I need to be around God's people. What do the people who don't know Christ need? Well, they need to hear about Jesus, right? So I need to keep that in mind, and I keep reminding myself as I'm going back and over and over again. And if you've been walking with Christ over the years, you're hardly ever going to come to church or read something in your Bible that you've never seen before. Matter of fact, when you, if you've been there for a while and you hear something that you've never heard before, you automatically just raise a little yellow flag up and wonder if it's even there, right? But the issue here is that the struggle that we have is that we forget who we are. We forget who God is. Problems become big and God becomes small, right? We forget what's good and true. And God has to keep reminding us, right, in terms of that. So, the Word of God, and then finally, watch and pray. Now, this last part, Paul just steps all over himself and talks about the need to watch and pray. I used to think that this was primarily about me setting up a particular time to pray every day. And that's important, right? You ought to have a place where you just pull aside and you pray. And you think through the little battles that are going on in your kids' lives, in your husband's life, in your friend's life, in your wife's life. And you start praying for them because you're watching out for them and you know what may trip them up today. So if I know my sister Tracy is in a real time of pressure and I know her really well, 
then I know how the evil one may tempt her today. And it's almost say, God, please, would you give her strength to see you as great and powerful? Would you sustain my sister Rhonda today? And she's in some physical pain. Lord, would you help her to trust you that you're good and that the only thing that she can do is call out to you? And God, help us Lord, to walk and follow you in that. Help us not to bail out on that moment. Right? Well, you're praying, you're watching out because you know what the evil one wants to do when somebody's in pressure. And here's another one. You know that somebody's doing really well. Well, so your kid's crushing school. Well, then you need to be praying against arrogance. Right? You need to be saying, God, help them right, to give you the glory for that. Help them to be a person that from the strength and the gifts that you've given them that they love other people. God, do have mercy, right? All those kinds of things as you're thinking about your spouse or your friend, right, or your brother in Christ, are you praying for them because they're in a battle today? They're in a battle today. And if you know them well, you know where the battle is, right? And so you're praying, and you're always praying. And so not only should you, should you be praying, but I've just found myself, and I do this all the time. It's just a reflex now. It's not because I have to think about it. Before somebody walks in my office, I pray. Because I don't know what's going to meet me on the other, end, other side of the conversation. Right? As I drove to church this morning, I prayed. Turned off everything, and if you'd have seen me driving down Washington and Bell Road today, I was just talking out loud to a non-existent somebody in the car. And I was just saying, Lord, I, I, here's how I feel. And today, this morning, I got up and I felt down. I felt depressed. And I got up this morning and I said, God, I need you to let me see you and see who you are, and I need to be brought into the reality that you're ruling and reigning, and you got things to do this morning. You want to you transform people. You want to encourage people. You want to stop people from heading down the wrong direction. God, you're busy today. Help me to enter into that today. Right? I, I just had to do that today. And then, and then, and then when I pray at my meals, I, I actually do want to pray. Watch yourself. Do not get into the habit of just saying the same thing all the time. Stop yourself. Right? Think about what you're saying. And even if you've gotten the habit of saying the same thing every time, don't pray next time until you think through what you want to say. Right? If you find yourself getting impatient when other people pray, well, then you know you're in a battle. Because what does the evil one not want you to do? He doesn't want you to pray. If you're in a group of Christians and it feels awkward to pray, you know who's doing that? That's the evil one. You ever had that moment where you think, I think we should pray, and then it feels awkward, and you're with a bunch of believers? The evil one wants you to make you think, you know, you're holier than thou when you feel like praying. Oh, you don't want to come off as, you know, super spiritual or something. Well, God forbid that we come off looking spiritual, right? And the issue is, yes, you can be full of pride. You can try to elevate yourself and make that a badge. But on the other hand, in the events, the activities that you're involved with with your friends, you ought to begin them with prayer. You ought to invite God into your Christmas parties, you ought to invite God into your shared friend group times. You ought to invite God into your family celebrations. If you're going to invite your families over and aunt so-and-so is coming and uncle so-and-so is coming and grandma and grandpa are coming and everything, as a family before you, you make a beautiful setting like it is this morning. Thank you for whoever put all this together. It's just beautiful. But you ought to get together as a family, link arms around there and say, God, please use us in this moment right, to be a sweet aroma of Jesus for these people. And you may never even mention Jesus in the moment, but you're just going to be there in that moment, and you want to respond to people, you want to care about them, you want to get off your phone and look at the person in the face, right, all those kind of things, because you're on a mission to love people, right, in terms of that, and you, you got to watch and pray for it because you'll lose your mind, okay? So here, this takes us as kind of running off of what will uh, had last week with all the things that God had given us. But here's the things that if you're going to do battle today, and I hope you'll just grab one of these. And I'm just putting them out in terms of, of you want to stand against and stand for. So what's one of the ways that Paul's taught us to do battle? Lift your eyes up, stop looking down. Right? Chapter 1, he opens with a whole psalm of praise. Before you take off today and you look down at the things that you're struggling with, you need to pause and look up and realize who God is. I look up first, right? Then when you look down, things are not so big, right? Look up first. I say, God, you're great. You're good. You've rescued me. You've made me your son. 
You've set your favor on me forever. Lord, you've conquered everything that truly threatens me. You've empowered me with the very power of Christ. That's who I am today. I want to go out on that day. And Lord, you're big enough for what I'm facing today. So look up before you look down. And I would say before you look around. Right? And then the second one, promote peace, not hostility. Right? Think about, I need to pray Right, if you ever felt, because if you're down, I've had to pray, Lord, help me to deal with the stuff in my life because I know my face is hostile right now. All right, Tracy's amen to that, right? I mean, seriously, I, my, you're, what's going on in your soul is going to spill out on somebody. And if you're not dealing with it, somebody else is going to get it, right? And you need to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm discouraged today. Lord, I'm angry today. Lord, I'm, I'm, I know I'm struggling with getting bitter today. Lord, I know I am. And Lord, you know my heart. And, and I want to be a peacemaker. I don't want to spread this bitterness. I don't want to spread this anger. I don't want to come out here and, and be a person that encourages people to break off from each other. I don't want to be that kind of person. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to be that. And then join in. Don't opt out. Right? What is the Spirit doing? He's not just brought you to himself, but he's brought us to each other. And so one of the pictures, and you look at this at the first part of chapter 4, right? He's made us a body, and we all have different gifts, and he's given gifted people to the body. And what, what is the body supposed to do? Each part does its work. Well, it's not the Spirit's work for you to sit on the edge of the community and let everybody else do the work, or for you not to take a position of leadership because you don't want the responsibility. Everybody should be looking for responsibility, Opt in. Don't opt out. Don't hang on the edges, right? Come in and do the work of the body, right? Some of you are going to get frustrated at your Christmas celebrations because you're going to find family members who opt out, right? Meaning everybody else is cleaning and they're in there watching football games, right? Or everybody else is engaging, but they're on their phone over in the corner of the house not talking to anybody, Right? Well, you want at the church, we we can't have people that just come in and say, "I'm here, but I don't want any entanglements with the people in here." No, the Spirit of God is is moving you to get all entangled and messed up with this group of people. Right? So that one there, and then tell the truth, don't lie. Okay, now that's harder than it than it sounds, is it not? Right? Tell the truth. Right? And this this begins telling the truth. Uh, about the people that love you and know you and when they're trying to probe you and you trust them, that you're honest with them about your struggles, right? And that you're going after people in love, right? Speaking the truth in love when you see them getting out of bounds. You don't excuse bad behavior. You don't try to cover it up. You don't try to justify it. You tell the truth, right? In terms of that, work, don't steal, right? Chapter five, speak grace, don't debase. I had to, uh, I had to rhyme that one there, right? Right? Well, the issue is here is, is this is, you know, all kinds of filthy talk. The kind of conversation I have shouldn't raise problems for you uh, in terms of temptation. It shouldn't tear you down. It shouldn't misrepresent you. It shouldn't misrepresent God. I shouldn't discourage you in your faith. Right? I shouldn't be debasing the reality of God and his goodness in your mind. I should be lifting him up, even if I'm struggling, right, in terms of that. So I don't want to do that. And I want to open my heart. I don't want to close it. This is the one where he says that we should be people who are forgiving, who are grace showers. We should be kind and tenderhearted, right? Not bitter and angry, right? And, and if you've ever been around a bitter and angry person, they want to punish other people because they're bitter and angry, right? And they just go after you and you, you say hello and they say, uh, shut up, right? What's so good about today? What's so good about today? Oh, you people who get a smile on your face. I hate people with smiles on their faces. I mean, all, all that kind of stuff like that, where you're a person, instead of opening a heart and encouraging a person to come toward you, if that person wants to come toward you, it, it's like they have to be the knight in Sleeping Beauty, and they have to get on armor and get a sword and cut down all the briars to move toward you because you're, you just look like you're ready to duke it out with them. Okay. And, and you can be an open-hearted person or you can be closed-hearted. And right now, I, I, I've told you this myself too, if you've been hurt by somebody in here, the evil one wants you to close your heart off to them for good. And it's going to take courage and a want to to open your heart up again. 
Will you get hurt when you open your heart? Yes. But what happens if you lock your heart away from other people? It doesn't get preserved. It just dies. Right? So then... Uh, restrain yourself. Don't go out of bounds. This is chapter 5, right at the very beginning about our sexual desires. We as the people of God should be helping each other to keep our sexual desires in bounds, right? And this becomes something we have to say more and more because our culture has no bounds. Our culture has no bounds, right? And so to talk about the goodness of keeping your sexual desires within the family, the goodness of restraining yourself as a brother and sister this side in your dating life from sexual activity sounds weird and freakish, right? The goodness of, of not getting out there involved and involving lots of other women or men in your sex life through pornography, that seems, that's so accepted and so pervasive, but for a follower of Christ, that's no, no. No, I'm going to restrain that. I'm going to trust God that for me to say no to that is good for me. It's good for everybody in my life. It's good for all the women in my life and all the children in my life and for the commitments that I have, right? And I keep reminding myself about that. And then walk in the light, right? Chapter 5, not, don't go dark, right? That passage here, don't participate in the works of the darkness, right? I love that famous phrase, you sleeper, wake up and let the light of Christ shine on you. Right? Don't go into the dark. Let the light shine on you. And when you come out in the light of God's word and the light of God's truth as his people represent it to you, it makes things that are dark look dark. Right? One of Pastor Will's favorite things, you know, your, your family don't become a fool. Right? Your family don't act like a fool. And the family often helps us when we are fools and say, you know, you're acting like a fool right now. Because they want to bring the light to bear to save you from your foolishness. So walk in the light, don't go dark. Sober up by the Spirit's wisdom, don't get drunk on foolishness, right? So here's the Spirit's wisdom to us, right here. Right? Sober up. Get reminded of who we are. This is where we want to get sobered and reminded here today. I have to get reminded. Ron is perfect 99% of the time, but when she's not, it's a rare occasion, <clears throat> I get angry. I get angry, I get, I get disappointed, and I, and I get, I get uh, full of self-pity, and, and I'm not being treated the way I deserve. She didn't treat me the way I deserve, and so I don't have to treat her the way that, that, that God asks me to. <clears throat> and then I turn over to Ephesians 5, and, and I just hear God say, you know, Greg, I love you, just shut up, you're stupid, right? You're stupid, right? That's how, that's how the world thinks. That's not how I loved you. That's not what I called you to do. I called you to love her the way I've loved you. Yeah, but God, she didn't know. No, don't tell me about what people did that makes them unlovable. Don't tell me about that. I think I know that, right? So Greg, let's go step back at the cross a little bit. Okay, all right, Jesus. All right, now love her. Okay, all right, that's hard. Yeah, okay, so you've got all the resources you need. Okay, all right? I can be a fool. Everybody in here can be a fool, all right? I need to be sobered up. I need the spirit to tell me who I am, all right? And then play your role. Don't get out of character, all right? What kind of employee are you? What kind of boss are you? What kind of wife are you? What kind of husband are you? What kind of child are you in your family? And let me, let me speak to all of us when it comes to <clears throat> being a child. Everybody in here is a child, right? And the command to honor your parents and treat them appropriately exists for as long as they live. And that means you might be like myself in my 60s and my mom is in her 80s and that command to honor her still applies to me. And so when you're with your family over Christmas, what does it mean for you to honor the people in your life? Are you playing your role, right? There are kids that are ripping the hearts out of their parents, despising them, ignoring them, thinking that their peers have more wisdom than they do. All those kind of things are happening, right? So the issue here is, are you playing your role? Dad, are you being a dad? 
Well, I tell you, you come over to the holidays with all the craziness is gone, there will be plenty of opportunities for you to exasperate your kids. Right? Or that your kids will be exasperating. Let's put it that way. We'll put the burden on them. Right? Uh, so you, if you're going to have it, right, are you prepared for it? Are you prepared to walk through that and play your role? Mom, to play your role? Right? Are we ready as a church to play our role as God's missionaries? As a picture of his redeeming work, we're called his new humanity. Are we ready for that? So let's play our role. Don't get out of character. So here, right, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Right? So let's put it on so that we can know life, we can enjoy God's triumph, and we can proclaim it. <laughs> proclaim it, right? For our blessing and for the blessing of our church and for the blessing of our families, for the blessing of our marriages, for the blessing of our workplaces, right? May God make us people who are ready, ready, right, for what's going to bring us, right? Grayson, will you come and lead us? Uh, I, 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 I had a song. I asked Grayson to sing this one. I'll, I'll take the heat for this one. Uh, in term, this is an old school song. So some of the old people in here will know this old hymn, uh, but it just fits. It just fits where we are. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, right? Soldiers of the cross. All right, here we go.